All right, I'm rolling now, just so you know. Uh, Perfect. Thanks, thanks for being on time. Dude, what are you doing running a, a what? An eight, an eight second 60? Well, no, hang on. Six. Sub eight, all right? Seven, eight, five. The new <laughs> personal best as of last weekend. <laughs> wow. How old are you, man? Uh, I just turned 30 uh, in June. Wow. And you've been doing track for how long? Not that long. Well, I, I, it's a funny thing. It's been a long time since I well, since I've started, and, it, and it's even been longer since my 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 early retirement. So I uh, did track in elementary school, and after that stopped. Uh, I think I was forced to do a few uh, high school track meets because the same uh, coach for track was the basketball coach, and he used that as leverage for us to do track. And no one really wanted to do track after elementary school. Then I stopped, and I, I rejoined track when I heard about the wonderful world of master's track uh, three years ago. So I took like a 16-year hiatus from track, and then I got into it again, you know, uh, with people that are ages, you know, 30 to 70. So uh, there's a whole community of folks that are picking up track again to stay fit and stretch well and recover well and be with a community of motivated individuals so i'm blessed to be back into track and i run for u of t uh their masters uh team which has meets all the time and we've got a fantastic coach great team so i like to do track whenever i'm not sprinting in business <laughs> well it's awesome it's at the top of your feed and uh i just thought wow that's impressive man that's uh, like uh, uh, hey i'm no uh track star anymore but uh <laughs> It's still uh -huh. bottom bottom twenty percent when you compare your times to the to the university students that we race against. Funny enough, so you know you got to keep a good attitude. <laughs> What's the masters refer to? Is that age? Uh, I think age. Yeah, exactly. Traditionally, so, I think masters are thirty five and up, but they allow thirty. And I even I even joined in my late twenties. But but I guess under thirty is the open. So that means you race against people that are literally, you know, a lot of them are university or qualifying for the Olympics. And I did a few of those, which is pretty demoralizing. And then once you're in past 30, you race against people that are a little bit older. So you're supposedly uh, a, a bit, uh, a little bit faster, relatively speaking. <laughs> cool. What else are you up to these days? Yeah, good question. Uh, you know, I mean, beyond all, all, all the fun things I do in business, uh, what else am I doing? Uh, I'm really getting into, into space. I'm watching uh, a ton of, I rewatched Cosmos the other day, not Carl Sagan's, but um, the more refreshed one with, um, oh, our good friend, uh, what's his name? I'm already blanking, uh, but he's awesome. It's the refreshed Cosmos. Uh, and what else am I doing? Um, traveling between BC and Toronto. I've got another you know, family and a lot of my team over there. Um, I am. Um, I just got a citizenship uh, pending for Spain, uh, so I, I met a notary of my brother. I think it was last summer, and it was through this really crazy government program. Uh, if you can show ties to some of the um, the people that were banished from uh, Spain in 1492, primarily if you're of a Sephardic Jewish faith, they have a fast track program which they just closed in October. Around uh, yeah, if you can prove that, you get a citizenship, and they've got this master list that. Uh, we were on, luckily, and we somehow have made it happen. So I'm looking to be a Spanish citizen in the next couple of years. Uh, fingers crossed I get the passport. Awesome. Paul David Eskew, did I say that right? You got it. That's the Romanian mouthful name, yeah. yeah. I watched your clip of uh, you guys on uh, Dragon's Den there. It was from five years ago, eh? That was. That was back when and I had less, less gray hairs. I couldn't, less help but, I couldn't help but notice how disappointed Arlene was when you set her up with her colleague, Mike, instead of your partner, Jonathan. <laughs> I know. That's a, a, a very astute uh, observation. In fact, we were going to have uh, Arlene and my uh, Thor-like business partner, John, uh, go on that date for the demo. But we actually heard from a fellow entrepreneur who was on the show a month before when we shot it in April. This didn't air until November. And he knew, he went for a drink with Michael. He knew that he had a thing going on with, with Arlene, like a romantic thing. So we knew that if we substituted Michael for John, they might actually do something interesting. And if you saw the episode, of course, they, they made out on the show. And it's a, it's a highlight reel for Dragon's Den, which was great for PR and a good story piece. So it was, there was some strategy behind that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. But tell us uh, what, about what you're doing in mortgages. I, I'm, I've, I've had one mortgage guy my whole career, 25 uh -huh. years, 26 years yeah. in the state. 
and uh, he's finally retired. So I, I'm looking for a guy, and I know that you, you guys can work remotely. I've I've tried a couple other guys out through my brother. He's a realtor as well. And um, nice. Tell us a little bit about what's happening in the business. Maybe any new products that are coming on the market, and of course, you know, in my area, everyone wants to know how to buy no money down, no, uh, you know, without sticking your neck out at all, without the banks knowing about it. So tell us about anything that's new in your business. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And just a quick high level. I mean, it, it, it's worth considering kind of where I came from to answer that question. So I come from the, as you talked about Dragon Sand, from the marketing and technology world, uh, specifically, uh, we, we, did, we started in the restaurant uh, industry. And uh, yeah, we made a parallel move into the real estate industry with the agency. And now, of course, level up mortgages where um, we kind of saw some patterns when we were doing marketing services for mortgage brokers who were not very tech progressive, can't brand themselves, pretty bad at sales not organized, not systemized. Uh, and we realized that there's, um, and I think also beyond like just finding the lowest rate, you have to add extra value. So yeah, we actually spun out Level Up Mortgages through the agency who does all the marketing for Level Up. And yeah, we've kind of developed a, a brand that I think really looks at uh, being transparent and we stay lightning fast with customer demands. And also we use a lot of automation so that people can be informed what the hell is going on, whether it's you as a realtor or a consumer. So Level Up Mortgages is a, uh, is really about people um, planning towards getting pre-approved in the best way possible. And as you may know, the mortgage stress test and all kinds of things have happened the last couple of years where it's, it's very hard to get a mortgage. And especially if you're self-employed, which by the way, is a huge part of the economy and it's growing every year. Thanks to our, our, our buddies here at, uh, at uh, Shopify, especially here in Toronto, it's very hard to qualify for a mortgage being self-employed. So we're very focused on self-employed. And uh, a big thing with us is, yeah, just kind of helping people save money long term. To your point around rates, I mean, we were as low as 2.24 in November. Now it's back up to 2.6. It's still quite low. I think as of two days ago, Bank of Canada left the overnight rate at what it is. And I, through the great one, I'm hearing that's going to drop again for March once it gets busy again. Um, but yeah, anyways, uh, that's kind of a bit about sort of what we were seeing in the market, what makes us different. And I'm just seeing that there's a lot of education needed nowadays, especially for first time home buyers. There's a lot of incentive programs out there, which uh, could be a good deal or could not be a good deal. I did a whole YouTube series on like, is the first time incentive program worth it if the government takes 5% equity in your home today and you have to give them that 5% back in 25 years? You've got to make a calculation. How much will my, how my, will my house appreciate versus how much will I save from having more of a down payment thanks to them putting in the other 5% or 10% if it's, uh, if it's a new build? And what's that trade-off? So there's a lot of education needed, and especially for self-employed, uh, you, need, you need to really get your, your stuff together. So anyway, that's a little bit of like a, an overlying look at like where we come from, why we're different, what we're seeing in the market, and who we kind of serve most. So your businesses feed each other then? I mean, it sounds yeah. like you're, you know, you're, you've got a marketing company, an agency, and then totally. you know, level up sounds like something you got into because you were doing the marketing for what? Mortgage brokers and decided, well, I might as well be in the game myself. Yeah, one thing we saw is that a lot of mortgage brokers, when we were talking to them, we had a few early adapter customers. We do lead generation for them. We get them customers. We put them at the doorstep, and then they, of course, have to close it, which is another story. They have to be, of course, good at that and systemized. But I think a lot of them have been burned by having the wrong expectations and also not being very systemized. And, and I think there are some really bad marketers out there who are, uh, who are very bad at setting expectations. So for us, it was an uphill battle trying to convince people that what we're doing works short and long term. So eventually, we, we just realized that you're going to have to practice what you preach. So I said, you know what? What if we literally launch a mortgage team and we use Tangu services? We literally eat our own dog food is, is the expression nowadays. And then if we're the success story and if we're the living case study, then how can you argue with what we do if we're doing it for ourselves, right? And that's something that we've done. And you know, it's still early days. We launched it about six months ago, but as of now, we've got some amazing realtor partners. We've done some great seminars. We have a, an explosive uh, social media uh, account, which is of course great for keeping people informed on different programs. We have a YouTube channel. Um, those are all things that I think the industry is trying to take notice on how we're you know, coming in and giving it a bit, of, a bit of a fresh approach. And I think what we learned in the agency side, even the technology side, when we uh, launched our app on Dragon Center, you have to be very progressive. You have to embrace technology, but also realize that technology is a tool to then go face to face. And I think some people are either too tech focused, so they have no really, they have no, um, I guess, concept of how to interact with someone and, and sell them and more so educate them. And you've got the very old school people that are all about hand to hand. Let's meet at a coffee shop. Like I don't take phone calls. I want to meet you. And <laughs> they're, 
they're almost they're almost a bit more like you know they're not with it and they're not efficient so we're trying to, we're like this perfect i'd say midpoint between tech driven for efficiency and education education purposes and also scale and then we're also people that are you know we understand the value of face to face so yeah it's kind of a, a taking the best of both worlds i guess is a way to answer your question yeah how's the business changed i mean in my market we've seen a lot of big city people coming in from to uh, I'm, I'm in niagara so i'm only an hour away right uh, totally and you know the the um the hands-on is is well, it's a lot more hands off now, you know, it's uh, mm -hmm. a lot of texting, a lot of, uh, you know, even, even when we had facts, I, I don't remember these many documents going back and forth with DocuSign. Mm -hmm. it, whereas, yeah. you know, sometimes you never even meet the people, you close a deal and, totally. and you, there's no personal touch anymore. Is that, is, have you found some similar changes in the mortgage industry and, and marketing? 100%. Yeah. hundred percent. Look at who's buying homes now, right? Millennials, even some, you know, some Gen, uh, some Gen Zs, right? Like they're already in the market. Um, you know, they're in the mindset now. They care about time much more than other generations as far as efficiency. They also really care about um, doing a bit of their research beforehand before they have a conversation, right? So that's why it's so important for you is, you in professional services or any company nowadays, you have to, two things you got to realize is that you have to earn people's time to even be on the phone with them. They're pre-qualifying you the same way you want to pre-qualify them, by the way. And, you know, people want to already be sold on you to some degree and then ask you very specific questions based off a core piece of uh, content they've seen. Maybe they've read, them, read your blog post. At the very least, they've seen your website and they want to come at a very specific question. There's no point of getting tailored like asking you tailored questions until they have to. So if they have a generic question, they're just going to Google it. Like it's just more efficient. They don't have to get into a phone call. Then they know that you, you know, you think they're a lead and then, and then you're going to, you're going to call them a thousand times, which I mean, I don't blame if you're a salesperson, someone calls, you know, someone calls you up, you want to of course engage in that. So yeah. I think it's you know, the, the rules have changed. And that's, that's more on the, on that initial phone call interaction side, as far as like, DocuSign for uh, efficiency on, on, on document, um, you know, exchange, using Dropbox to store documents. I mean, that's all I think table stakes. Now, you'd be crazy not to do that. Yes, there's security concerns on that. You have to be smart about it. But generally speaking, that stuff, I think it's pretty good now. Uh, and, and yeah, I think just home buyers now, um, they're also shopping around more. So they can't physically be in 10 different places at once, right? Which is why they shop around and that's why they do it all remotely. They're not going to meet you until they're like committed on you. So basically you're buying for business until, until you meet someone, you're, you're basically one of 10 other people, which is a, a whole other conversation. If you look at the dating world, if you look at, you know, what's having professional services, too many options. I think that's, that's done at a detriment, but also I think it's great that there's so much more accessibility. There's an even playing field. And now to add value to search professional, it's not just about, you know, your lowest rate or, you know, how, you know, how, well, it's important to be, to think about how fast you can be on replies. That's actually very important, but there's table stake things now that you need to stand out now with, with how well you tailor to that individual and how well you meet them where they want to be met. And that goes back to again, technology. So yeah, 99% of people for a lot of top producing mortgage agents, they never meet. Mm. That's the reality. Where do you find your leads are funneling through? Is it all from online or word of mouth or are you brokering, yeah, brokering yeah. deals with mm -hmm. agents? I know there's a mix of that, but you know, where your cold leads come from somebody just off the street saying, Hey, I found you on whatever. You totally. Know? Yeah. Uh, all the above primarily with us, I mean, the way we look at things is two things, right? So we work a lot on what the agency preaches, which is, yes, it's lead generation on Facebook and Google, primarily Facebook. Um, we do a lot of blog writing and SEO, meaning that we want some of those leads to actually read a blog post that educates them on something. Therefore, when they call us up, they're asking us about something at a sophisticated level versus, hey, what's your best rate? This is how you weed out rate shoppers versus people that act actually want to tap into your expertise and aren't going to make you buy down your rates. Um, and yeah, of course we have centers of influence. I mean, of course, you know, real wrong thinking of the realtor first before they think nowadays, and especially the, the Toronto market. The hot market that um, there's a lot of sellers, home sellers that are not even leaving, giving you time for subject removals. So imagine you put your deposit down, they're like, hey, there's, you have zero dates to do any subject removals. You either buy it or you don't. If you're not 110% sure that you've been pre approved for financing and you give your deposit, guess what? You're not getting that back when you realize that the stress tag.
test and a bunch of other new lender policies are going to, you know, are going to give you maybe access to half the capital you expected you would get. So, so yeah, so that's, that's a huge kind of thing, right? Where, you know, you have to really do that research. So, so again, centers of influence are the realtors and how do they get connected with us? I think as a mortgage broker, you have to add more value than saying, Hey, I'll be a really reliable mortgage broker. Of course, that's important. You have to do that. But you know, what we do is we do a lot of co-marketing with our realtor partners. Either I coach them on personal branding, social media, resources from the agency so that I can help them build their business. And of course, once we work on a project together, they understand uh, how we're awesome at communication, getting things done and being very kind of personalized. And that's kind of the acting instead of saying, and then they know when they do a mortgage with us, we're going to act the same way to the clients and the way we act with them. So we kind of act, you know, and we do that by ad first, which again, starts in marketing. And that's kind of the world I come from. That's a big advantage we've had in, you know, hooking up with top producing realtors um, who, you know, have tons of other mortgage brokers, but they're pretty dispensable because they're not adding extra value uh, beyond, of course, there's the tenure, but a lot of them, you know, it, it's table stakes now. So we're really trying to add value around helping our partners sell better. And how do you differentiate yourself from the, from the crowd? Because I mean, mortgage brokerage has got to be very competitive now. And I mean, the banks have seen you guys creep into the market as well. So how do you, how do you, you know, cut yourself loose from the crowd? Yeah, great question. Uh, so for our target market, which is a lot of self-employed uh, newcomers and, uh, and folks that we say are self-improvement focused, first of all, like, yes, like, you know, let's start from the very basics. So we work with a lot of non-bank lenders and, you know, I'm not sure how, how educated you are on the difference between like an MCAP, a First National and a TD, right, or an RBC, but usually the bigger banks, they won't drop their rates until three months after the market does. Why do they do that? Because they know that people think of them as a monopoly, so they're just profit maximizing. But there's a great article in the Huffington Post that talks about how they're usually at least a few months back. So yeah, there's usually much better rates of non-bank lenders, which are just focused on mortgages, and we do a ton of that. So of course, you're going to get savings from that. I think also like when you look at, you know, I mean, the biggest thing is the service, right? Because there's some mortgage tech companies that if you look at, you look at Rate Hub, for example, or some mortgage tech companies, if it's all about rates there and you want zero service, you go for that and that's great. We play more the premium side where you're still getting great rates. But the people that I that I filter out are people that, again, especially are self-employed, have probably been turned down by the banks. And a lot of them, honestly, might be, you know, six months to a year away from buying, but they want to get educated first because, again, back to the millennial conversation, they want to get educated and they want to learn first. A lot of mortgage brokers won't have the system to properly follow up with them or they just won't have the willingness to educate them. They're kind of looking for that quick deal. We're very patient with that. We, do a, we create a lot of content on YouTube and, and blog posts. So we're educating way before the sale happens. So we're building relationships and then we're staying in touch with our database. And I think just the way that we approach customer service to add value first, nurture for a long time, again, using automation to some extent because you can't be in a thousand places at once. That's a big, that's a big differentiator. And at the end of the day, I think when they talk to us, especially if they're self-employed and they, they learn about our history and how I've built myself as an entrepreneur and the challenges that I've been through, they just resonate with that. It's, it goes beyond the mortgage. It's about increasing your income, decreasing your debt and being organized. So the three things for your debt service ratio is to get a mortgage. But we also translate that to that's what we do for you. And we do a lot of coaching. Again, back to the coaching, the realtors for their marketing or, or coaching our, our clients with marketing in ways they can improve. They really appreciate that. And I don't see a ton of that in the industry. Who are you following these days with the coaching and the motivational speakers? I mean, we talked a little bit about it offline, but and sure, yeah. I, I go back to Napoleon Hill being the godfather of everything. I think everyone's, anybody that's any, ever done anything motivational or a philo any, any philosophy or anything seems to go 100%. back to the roots of uh, Napoleon Hill. But uh, who, are, mm -hmm. who are you crushing on right now as far as content consuming? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm looking at uh, lots of folks. Uh, I think I mentioned that. Um, I mean, I'm really interested in the way, the direction Tim Ferriss is taking, but if his focus, so, you know, Tim Ferriss, again, he's the four hour uh, work week guy who was all about productivity for a little while. And he still is, of course, and all about personal hacks, which I love. I'm very into personal development, but I think he started to realize that, um, I think the world needs a bit more stillness. He wouldn't be more present with each other, which is something Ryan Holiday, who's a, a fantastic young author, he just wrote a book uh, around stillness, uh, something that he's really preaching. And the way, it's, of course, Tim's looking at it, he's really got into the world of psychedelics, which I think really blew up onto the scene uh, end of last year. Um, there's a ton of literature around how there's a ton, you know, there's a lot of uh, trials now on how people who are suffering a PTSD or mm -hmm. cancer or certain depression uh, you know, these drugs are making this huge comeback now where it helps people be present with, uh, I think, very deep things that you, you definitely can't uh, look at when you're busy, nor when you're actually, I guess, 
you know, let's call it sober. So I think it's really interesting that the, the sort of the medical benefits of that for certain people that are, again, are in mental illness basically. But of course you hear about microdosing in the Silicon Valley and you, this entrepreneurs who are more than, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're cognitively functioning at, at an amazing capacity, but with the use of psychedelics responsibly and once in a while, you see that they're getting these amazing insights and very present with each other so that after they do the psychedelics, they suddenly realize they have to be more to meditation. Other ways of getting to a pure state of mind, they have to take time for themselves. They have to do better self-care. And, and a lot of times, again, whether it's psychedelics or even just certain you know, stress relievers, exercise even, people are starting to finally be a bit more still and more present. And again, for, I think for creativity and health, it's such a big thing, especially in this crazy social media world where people are like me talking a thousand words a minute, but also their brains functioning at that pace. And I think it's a big problem. So I love how he's, and he's big into meditation as well, by the way. So I think stillness, meditation, and if, if need be psychedelics, I think are all amazing new cutting edge things that are, I think, changing people's perspectives. Um, if you look a bit more, you know, philosophically around, well, Let's take a step back around like what drives you. I look at, you know, the classic is Simon Sinek, right? Start with why he's got a book around that. And he's got a new book called The Infinite Game where he's all about the mindset of people buy, they don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, which goes back to your question on how are we different? We have a mantra of leveling people up. We want you to be at your best as a human being. I think people really dig that versus just looking for the lowest rates. But again, he's got, he's got that mantra. He's got a great, uh, he's actually in a ton of podcasts. I'm not sure. I think he has his own as well. Um, I really like what he's doing. Um, those are all big ones. I mean, Tony Robbins is of course a classic. He's big into personal finance when things important. Uh, so I, I haven't seen his content recently, but I think it's all really good as well. Um, yeah, those are kind of the, some of the main thought leaders that I look at. I mean, I'm always following Elon Musk, of course. Uh, I think what he's doing is fantastic. It goes back to my our preamble around me getting a lot more into outer space and some and just look at seeing people do things that others don't think are possible. I think that's really badass and awesome. But yeah, those are some of the people that right now I'm following. And again, there's that trend of stillness and presence that I really I think is important. I have, I've heard very little, but only just recently about the microdosing, especially on Wall Street. Like these are, are serious professionals that need to be focused yeah. and locked in. And mm -hmm. I can't, well, I mean, I've done those drugs in high school recreationally and mm -hmm. can't mm -hmm. imagine, uh, you know, being a little bit high on LSD or <laughs> just a little mm -hmm. bit on mushrooms. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it was that, you know, it was all, it was all, all or nothing type of thing. So I can't imagine it, but the, the, the younger generation, the, the up and comers are really using this to their advantage. It seems to lock in and just kill it. I'm surprised mm -hmm. by it. Mm -hmm. And some people, and some people do the microdosing, which I personally have not got into a whole lot, right? But some people, well, at all, really. I think the all or nothing, in my opinion, is to some degree better if you can just not do it too often. So there's people that do it you know, once a, once a year, maybe once a quarter and they yeah they have a full-on experience they have a they do it with deliberate they, they do it in a deliberate way they don't just do it and then just you know i don't know whatever watch tv they actually you know they set an intention they set goals down they've got activities they do with the right group of people like they do all it's a whole personal development exercise where you set wow. an intention around things you <laughs> want to do and then from there you know uh hopefully if it went well then you'll have some insights that you can actually act on and Yes, obviously, the way I'm, I'm of course, uh, talking about this, I have done it, and I think it's been, um, you know, pretty amazing uh, the effects it can have if you do it in the right way. So, so yeah, it, it's it's a it's a whole new world, it's a new decade, and I think you're gonna see things keep being destigmatized and more and more education, and there's gonna be a lot more, just like yeah, I think just best practices on how to do these things. And again, it's all going to be a, the trend towards being more mindful. And that's why you saw yoga and meditation take off last decade. This decade is going to be supplementing that with things that really, um, you know, knock people out of the inertia and have them being more mindful about where they're going, what they stand for. Where are you getting your biggest hits these days on social media? As far as that placement goes. Yeah. Return wise. Right. Yeah. Re return on investment. Uh, I mean, the thing Facebook is still as, as I didn't mention Gary Vaynerchuk as people I follow, but Gary uh, v, yeah, he's a player. Gary V, of course, yeah, he's a uh, he's, yeah, he, he's a mouthful and, and awesome in, in his own respect. But like, he talks a lot about how influencer marketing and Facebook advertising is underpriced, uh, meaning that you know you can get a pretty good return on it if you do it properly. Uh, but yeah, but again, if you do it properly, people sometimes they'll boost a post or they'll post on their social media page and. Be like, oh, I'm not getting any leads from it. 
well, by the way, let's differentiate organic versus paid advertising. Organic when you post on your Instagram or your Facebook and you don't put money behind it. Guess what? Facebook owns both those companies, of course, and they want you to, they want to make money. So uh, I think the status for Facebook is you, if you have 100 followers and you post on Facebook, two of them see it. This is 100 of the, your hard-earned followers. So you've got to pay for your own database, which means you don't own your database, by the way. Uh, Instagram, I think, is about 10%. So you really have to pay to play basically. And then when you're paying for either Facebook or Instagram ads, it has to be really well thought out. You have to target the right audience, you need the right creative. And the thing is that you can't just be like, you know, it's, it's like dating, right? Of course, you, the proverbial dating analogy, right? You know, you can't really, you know, take someone home off the first time they see your brand, the first time they see you as a mortgage broker, as a realtor. It's like, you know, if they, hey, like call me for the best rates or hey, call me to, you know, help you buy your house. They're like, Hey, great. I've seen a thousand people like that. Like, why should I trust you? So we do a lot of, uh, it's called layered advertising because that's the way that I coin it where there's a cold audience, which has never been exposed to your brand. Right. And let's say, uh, what do you think they're going to be more into if they see a, like, Hey, call me for a consultation or they see a blog post talking about last, last September's first time home buyer sensitive program, what you should know to save $40,000 throughout the term of your mortgage. Mm -hmm. Right. So it engages them for sure. Yeah. Right. And then, so, but, but once they do that, if you put a cookie or a pixel on that blog post, which links to your website, I can then retarget that same person a month later. And I can literally be like, remember, did you read our blog post around the first time home buyer center program? Here's another update on that same program, or here's, here's another way for you to save money. Uh, you know, click here to view more or book a consultation. Then once they do that, they go to the next layer and I can re I can retarget now what's a warm audience with like, Hey, Talk to Paul. He's the one who wrote all the blog posts. And there's some things, you know, that are too long to write on a blog post and won't and may not apply to you unless you get a real consultation. So we've got this layered advertising approach where I use video, I use different kinds of ads, and I actually have these different segments of audience members through my Facebook ad manager where I can send them different ads based off the context and their buyer journey, which is like something you'll never get through radio, you will not get that through TV. It really is pretty fantastic if you go that route. That's the one thing. Now let's look at something very basic. Email marketing is still massive, but email marketing has to be personalized. It has to have good content inside of it, and it needs to be done on a consistent basis. So you know, a lot of the old-fashioned stuff, people are like, "Oh yeah, it's all going to my spam folder." Still, the most open uh, thing if you do it properly. So yeah, Facebook ads and things like email and SMS marketing, if done respectfully and in a very segmented, personalized way, uh, it can work really well for professional services. And really, I mean, I think most industries. Do you have a number on how many prospects it takes to get a, a, a hot lead or a prospect that's willing to buy or a deal closed for that matter? Sure. Things that I'm seeing uh, is if you do proper legion, you nurture them uh, well. I mean, you can get as high as a 10%, uh, you know, 10% people you talk to, to and what, one of them is going to be looking for a mortgage. Will they close tomorrow? Maybe not. So you've got to nurture them. That's all given that you're good on the phone and you know how to nurture. But yeah, I think, I think 10% is doable. That's on the high side from what I've seen. Um, I mean, look, if you, if you like, you know, I, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think they sell leads anymore in Ontario, but if you go, if you talk to rate hub, right? And, and they can resell you the leads that go to their website to look at mortgages. I think they do that in certain provinces. I mean, that could be up to 20% conversion rate, but keep in mind, you're getting people that are rate shoppers that are going to be having small mortgages, making you buy down your rate. And you might make one or $2,000 if you're lucky on it. So that's for like the very bottom of the barrel rate shoppers. Um, but for quality leads, again, it's going to be maybe one in 10, one in 20, and it's going to take six, six to 12 months um, to actually do it properly, right? And to nurture them. So, so yeah, those are some basic benchmarks that I've seen. Um, I think if you do lead gen and you're not nurturing people through your, through email marketing, you, you've, you've literally wasted your money because these people are early in their buyer journey, unless you're buying from rate hub or, or borrow well, or people that have higher intent leads, which are by the way, 80 bucks a lead, a lot more expensive. Um, even them you have to nurture, but you know, you really need to have the other systems in place or just throwing money at an ad. Hey, how do you find the technologies change your business? And is there any, you know, hot products out there now that are specifically there because technology's surpassing, you know, just it's a lightning speed, it seems. Totally. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's different tools that we use for the start on the marketing and sales front. So obviously a CRM is very important for managing your database. Uh, we use HubSpot and you can you use do, it. Yeah, you can use the free version. I actually haven't, I'm not even paying yet, right? And you can really stretch out the, the free version. Uh, and it's, it's quite fantastic. I mean, they're, you know, they're the, the thought you, leaders. Well, what's what's that? HubSpot gives you, I, uh, HubSpot give you, uh, other than, you know, tracking email or whatever. That's, uh, lots. They do, uh, 
Yeah, they, they, they at CRM, they have, a, I mean, they have like a call, they've got a sales product and a marketing product later on top of it. I do my newsletters through there. Yes, you can track notes, you can do email drips, you can, you know, there's a, there's a whole bot marketing now down in technology. There's, there's like messenger bot marketing where you talk to a bot and it, it sends you FAQ questions kind of as you go. Uh, they do that as well. Um, yeah, lots of good stuff to help you save time in, uh, I think, prioritizing leads and also uh, even getting the ball rolling with leads off your bot so that when they talk to you, it's been escalated and you've already answered a few questions and you've got more context. So yeah, actually, bot marketing is one thing that I'm doing a lot with the agency and that I think uh -huh. is a technology that is definitely, yeah, it's getting here, man. AI is getting here. Um, and I think it's being well received by consumers if it just saves them time and doesn't, and it's not a cop out for not giving them true customer service. So I think you do have to balance both. But yeah, HubSpot's a big one. Um, again, all the retargeting capabilities on Facebook we talked about, that's massive. Um, I mean, if I just look at my phone right now, if I look at the apps that, you know, that I'm using right now, um, I use Harvest, which is a time tracker. I use it for, just for productivity uh, standpoint. So I kind of track all the activities I do throughout a week to audit my time. That's a bit OCD and nerdy, but it does help if you're someone who's at a high performance and trying to really do a lot of things and do it properly. Uh, I do a lot of that. Uh, I use Slack, of course, which is a, you know, BC and Silicon Valley company. They're great for internal team communication. That's been fantastic. Um, there's a lot of power dialers that help you do cold calls. Like you do three calls at once and it doesn't connect. You know, it connects you with the call that picks up. <laughs> so I just learned about that today. I think it's called Mojo dialer that I haven't used it, but I think it's super interesting. Um, you know, I have to talk about, of course, you know, podcasting, and whatnot. Overcast is a great app where it, 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 you can create playlists of different podcasts. So the problem is if you listen to a podcast, you're like on iTunes, you're forced to look at a, a series of them under the same sort of, you know, I guess, producer. But once you run out, you procrastinate to be like, okay, what should, what should I listen to next? And then you're busy, you don't do it. You can make, a, you can make um, an actual playlist of like, let's say, best marketing podcasts. And you kind of add your favorite episodes from different podcasters cool. and it plays in sequence. So there's no procrastination. You can just rip through them. I do a lot of that. I use the waking up of Sam Harris in the Headspace app for meditation, uh, Audible for audio books. I mean, go on and on. Oh, wow. What's that? I, I saw a post of, of yours where you quoted Sam Harris or something like this. I'm like, man, this guy is yeah. all over the place with the Sam Harris is such a deep thinker for me. I'm not one, one of my favorite, really? you know, guys, but, uh, I really haven't given him a, yeah. a, a, much of a chance. I don't, I don't think, but uh, <laughs> what do you like about him? Um, I, I like him on the, on the side of mindfulness I and mean, he's got, he just created a meditation app, right? So I'm huge on meditation. I'm uh, closing in on a 1500 day streak. So, you know, once a day, so I'm pretty proud of that. And I think it's also a very useful tool for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually listen less to, less to his podcast and more, I'm more just into his meditation app. Although he's got a few pretty interesting episodes where again, back to the psychedelics conversation, he's interviewing a ton of the top researchers there and linking that to mindfulness. And it's pretty cool stuff he's doing. I think him and Tim are really on the same page with a lot of things. Um, but yeah, no, he's just the, and he, him and, Jordan, him and of course, Jordan Peterson, local UFT prof who's blown up in his own respect. They do a lot of things mm -hmm. together as well. So I think they, they challenge a lot of society's norms politically, uh, societally. I think there's a lot of cool stuff that they, that they challenge. And I'm, I'm a fan of, of course, looking at that stuff. And I know you're pretty big onto that as well. So uh, yeah, those are the reasons why I think he's, he's great. Yeah, two intellects like that debating or even just sharing ideas on a stage is, is pretty fascinating. Jordan Peterson's bright, man. I've uh, learned so much from that guy. It's unbelievable. But uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what are some of your favorite life hacks? We talked about that a little bit earlier. Sure. Yeah. I mean, life hacks, brain that hacks, I whatever you call them. Uh, yeah. I mean, so I, I think we talked offline about Jim Quick's podcast. He's a guy who's, I mean, he's all about optimizing your brain performance. Uh, and yeah, that's someone who, some of the things he's talked about is even things like body language. Like, you know, there's a Ted talk. I think the most watched Ted talk is when they talk about the power pose. Oh, really? Okay. I don't know. So if, if, so if, if, you, if you do this for a certain amount of time, like you will speak way better. You have less stuttering. You'll be more confident. It's like you smiling smile. when you're talking on the phone. Yeah, exactly. You if you smile. Yeah. No, but even, but it comes out in, in your body just being ready for it. So there's a lot of like, I think like, yeah, like again, just body movements you can do things like that. Those are great little life hacks. Uh, I used the Pomodoro timer. So it basically is, is a, this is the reason why TED talks are under are 18 minutes or less, right? Uh, attention span doesn't go, doesn't really hold well beyond that, whether it's someone's consuming information or someone who's actually giving out information. So what I do is I got a timer every 20, every 25 minutes, it, it, it rings and it kind of forces me to stop, breathe, 
and maybe take either a five second break or a five minute break and then get back at it really like hitting it hard. And when there's a time, when there's a timer, you're a bit more under the gun. You're not being distracted as much because you're like, there's time. There's, there's like a, you know, it's time bound. I think it's very important, right? Um, so I use a Pomodoro timer. You can download it on your desktop or on your app. That keeps me very productive. We talked about harvest, of course. Um, other life hacks are just like, yeah, like just, you know, like how do you, one well, thing I really like, I think people are really, um, they're really caught about procrastination, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and now that people are getting, you know, tugged in so many different directions from like, you know, phone calls or social media or just people's demands. Uh, I do something where I just kind of block and tackle my week. So I design an ideal week and I literally categorize uh, all the different things that I need to do, different activities that lead towards certain results. And I block it out ahead of time. And then I set them as recurring calendar invites so that when I have someone ask me something, Thing. I look and see, let's say a realtor wanted to meet with me. I look at my calendar. Oh, yeah, Thursdays are the time that I've realized it's the best time to talk to realtors because it's what and near the end of the week. They're less busy. I've done more, more of my daunting tasks earlier on. I'm a bit more social, et cetera, et cetera. And I try to slot them in at that time. And if, I, if someone says they want to talk right now, and I'm, I'm currently in my blog writing time, that it's an important task, but not urgent, that you always get you know, distracted from, I'll be like, hey, I'm, I'm doing deep work right now can't talk but let's talk for thursday so it gives you boundaries and it keeps you in line and it's something I, if you want i can, I can share my calendar with you you might get a kick out of it uh i can show you exactly what i mean if you want if you, yeah sure it's working I, you might be a little well, bit uh, a, freaked out by it what's that i feel like a caveman you're so i i, mean, I consider myself pretty techy but wow you talk <laughs> a minute to me man because <laughs> you're yeah you know, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here we go, right? Okay, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give you a quick peek. So, sharing my screen here. So, if you can see it right now, these are kind of uh, this is my week. This is an ideal week. So I know it can freak you out, right? But if I if I flip off my my hypothetical week, let me go to clicking this. This is actually what I have planned for a week. Okay. So it's not as bad. But yeah. when I flip on my my actual projects, uh, I've got recurring tasks and I've color coded them. So this is when I do my cold calls. Huh? Right. So someone calls me during here and it's not with what I need to be doing. I say, let's talk later. Here's when I talked about my Thursday today. Right. This is when I do my, uh, my realtor calls. Right. Uh -huh. Here's okay. when I do prospecting okay. first thing in the morning when you're, when your mind is fresh and after you've done track and field, you're creative, you're fresh. I do all my creative things, all my really other things that take a lot of willpower. I do in the morning things I don't want to do accounting, etc. cetera, uh, creative things, planning out my YouTube. I do again in the morning if I can. And uh, you see in the afternoon, it's mainly meetings and phone calls, anything that requires like, deep focus. I, I'm just not as in it. And there's more distractions too. So I really designed my life around activities that lead towards the goals of my different businesses that I think are important. So it's urgent things that I know I got to be doing or things that are important, but again, people impede on my boundaries. So anyways, this is a bit of a taste on ways you can really set boundaries. I think it's a huge thing for 2020 is like, how well can you say no? How, how disciplined are you? What's your willpower like? And I think you need systems to keep you in line. And again, you, uh, this is again, very OCD, but you have to be flexible too. My calendar is every month I'm going to change my calendar. And, and I'm also measuring, did I follow my calendar the way I thought it was going to be? I look, then I look at reality and I'm like, well, wait a sec. That wasn't practical. That was way too many things at once. So I'll adjust this over time. So it's an iterative process. That I think you have to be very mindful. You can't just nail it on the first try. Hmm. Wow, brother. What, uh, how much coaching are you doing? You seem like you've got your stuff really lined up. You'd be, you'd be a great a technology coach, especially for like a guy like me. It's been in the business 25 years, thinks he's got a handle on some of these products. And I'm like, HubSpot, what's it do? It tracks my email. That's all it does. Well, come on. What right, you right. I just yeah, I, yeah. I find that when I get too deep into uh, a technology or a program, I don't have the will. I, I kind of think like, you know what? Mm. That's someone else's job. I can't right. afford to have to learn everything. I don't. I can't afford to learn to SEO. That's my computer guy's thing. And I guess if you got the money, no, totally. You it, but you know, sure, uh, sure. Yeah. How how much coaching are you doing, if any? Yeah, uh, I, I I do coach some entrepreneurs. Uh, most of my clients that are you know doing mortgages, and again, if they're if they're self-employed, they will get uh, a little bit of coaching from me. A lot of my centers of influence, realtors, et cetera, they will get coaching as well. And a lot of it's just cross-pollination. We'll talk, we're talking about a deal, and then I, I save the last five minutes for like, hey, how's your business doing? 
Have you tried implementing the Pomodoro technique or how's your harvest timer? How is your HubSpot? Do you have any questions on that? So I kind of like, it's sort of like it's present in every conversation, but formal coaching, uh, I do just very specific clients on the, on the agency side. And then of course uh, on, on the mortgage side. So yeah, something that I, I think I'm going to be doing more and more of in the future. And I've got some exciting uh, e-courses and programs that I'll be launching probably near the end of the year to uh, you know, do it at scale and, and uh, I think empower other people to be coaches as well. And it's, it's very doable, but it has to be done in a certain way. So, so yeah, uh, dabbling into it, uh, but obviously very passionate about it. So, uh, you know, happy to entertain offers and just, you know, be, hopefully even just through this conversation, be a bit of a resource. I'm going to have to listen to this uh, and slow your speed down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey, <laughs> but the uh, I know. Talking about one more time. What's the, what's the program called? The 25 minute palm. It's it? called the Pomodoro timer. Just Google Pomodoro. it. And you'll, you'll see different extensions for it. Yeah. It's, it's a technique that has different apps built around it. But the idea is to refresh every 20, 25 minutes and take Correct. a break and, and zen yeah. or meditate or clear your mind and then come back hard. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting uh, philosophy. You know, it's uh, Stephen Kotler, when I was first introduced to him, when he was talking about hacking the flow, I'm like, what? Like, I, you know, mm. I don't really have those times where I'm frustrated and I've got the writer's block. I'm sure it happens a lot, but mm -hmm. I, I tend to be bouncing from job to job to job, and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like a, a mind like an air traffic controller. So I don't seem to be at, in one job for too long, but, you know, the, you know, I've been challenged to, to, put my all my content down in a book and you know it's if awesome. it takes me a year writing a page every day that's for you know the 300 and some odd pages uh but i you know i can't seem to like we talked about discipline offline mm -hmm. dude just looking at your calendar you know i think discipline is something that certainly you're born with and then you can learn you know a certain amount of it as well to be disciplined mm -hmm. or to practice it or coach yourself up on it but uh it seems to be like you you've got that one bagged. How do you how do you uh, how do you become an expert at that? Yeah, uh, it takes time, and I think it just depends on how much you care about it, right? How what your willingness is. Uh, Kobe Bryant, I think, had a really interesting interview recently. Who was, I forget which podcast it was on, but he talked about uh, stop negotiating with yourself. Oh. So what is what what does that mean? You set a commitment. You hopefully do goal setting, right? I like to do 90 day goal setting. It's not too long and not too short where you can adjust it along the way. You set a goal, you make it quantifiable. You, it's a smart goal. And you then set a weekly activity or a monthly activity that helps you get there. And hopefully you enroll someone to do it with you. And then at that point it's set. And if you at some point just don't feel like doing it, it's you're negotiating with yourself not to do it because of X excuse. And there's a thousand excuses. And sometimes they're valid when you're sick or something comes up. Again, you gotta be flexible, but generally speaking, you just gotta commit and do it. Uh, and I feel like people find excuses or they get again pulled in directions that don't serve them. And that's where I think people lose it on discipline and, and just honestly, just self-organization. So I, I think uh, just some more book references, Atomic Habits by James Clear. I've only read the synopsis actually, and I heard him on a podcast and his whole thing is about breaking it down, starting a very small and uh, organizing your physical space and your habits so that mm -hmm. you then get something called spillover habits, which is talked about by Charles, Charles Duhigg in The Power of Habit, where for example, and actually a, a big topic we haven't discussed a lot today is the, the, the topic of sleep, right? So Matthew Walker's uh, Why We Sleep book has been, and it's a bestseller already, and it's quite breakthrough actually. And he talks about like, you know, sleep is really the thing that can help so many other habits. So for example, if you don't sleep well, you're more stressed. You forget more things. If, when you have less sleep, you eat more. You have less willpower which then spirals into a whole bunch of other habits, smoking, whatever it is, bad habits. So let's say you start with a good sleep. How do you get a good sleep? Well, here's something that you got to know. If you eat three hours before bed, if you do exercise three hours before bed, if you look at a screen three hours before bed, those are all things that give you bad sleep. And then when you've got bad sleep, then it becomes this spiraling thing. So if you start with good sleep and then you uh, do exercise, let's say, whatever, 7 a.m. before work, so then your mind's rejuvenated, you've got to sleep, you're, you're, you're pumped out on these endorphins, and you have a somewhat organized day, that then helps you be more, you know, more disciplined. It's, again, there are these spillover domino effects. So I'd say start with sleep, um, and to some degree, you've got to have some form of exercise. But back to James Clear, he literally says, like, if, you can, if it's that much of a problem for you and you can't find someone to go with you, which I think is a great way for accountability, is like start by having your gym shoes literally next to your bed instead of your slippers. 
make it easy for you to remember to go. Make it so it's like looking at you in the face. And maybe step one for you is you literally put on your shoes and, and walk over to the gym or you drive to the gym and you go for five minutes. Like it's, it seems like a huge joke, but you just go, you did it. The first part of that was breaking through to actually go. You do five minutes and start mm -hmm. with something that's almost enjoyable. Start very slow. And then the next time you increment, you increment, you increment, and then your body has this amazing way to adapt where eventually it becomes a habit. Uh, it takes 67 days to, to, uh, for things to become habits. It's not the 30 days we're all kind of um, told, told about. There's actually a really interesting study on that. But anyways, you start very incrementally and you try to create habits around spillover habits such as sleep, fitness, uh, or, or it could be something around work, right? It could be around um, committing to, uh, again, maybe do cold calls, things, something that you're fearful of in the morning after your gym where you have like willpower and you're pumped on it and you've done your power pose, right? There's all these things you can put together. So anyway, it's a bit of a long answer, but um, that's kind of how I've started it. And then eventually you just build on top of it and you become, you become self-aware, you journal, you, 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 know, you reflect on things and you have to always be moving and really being self-critical, right? Uh, but in a healthy way. Now, how do we get introduced? Did you approach me on LinkedIn, was it? Yes. So we got introduced on LinkedIn, I believe, and, and yeah. a bit of a confession. I think it was my LinkedIn bot to send out a mass but personalized message to realtors in Ontario. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I've practiced uh, uh, certain scripts that work really well with people that are personable. And yeah, I think that's how we got connected. And then once you, once you, you know, then, then you look at my profile, you see what I've done and there's some, you know, some mutual, I mean, values that I think I really tried to show from that first impression. And then after that, it, it gets escalated to me and then we start talking and now we're doing this. Right. But again, automation is your friend if you don't spam people, but if you do, it's respectful, it's personalized. And then you escalate when it's worthwhile. And also you got to brand yourself well for the, for automation to work. So anyways, that's how we got connected. I'm surprised you got me with a bot. I'm, I'm proud of you though. Uh, I usually can sniff that kind of thing out. So you got something going well. Also, I've been thinking LinkedIn is dead to me because all I get is spam. Hey, you want this, you mm -hmm. want this, you want this. So you must have been different because I normally sure. reply. Uh, you know, I don't remove people either. I just don't go out to, you know, Gary Vee's yeah. saying that the organic reach on LinkedIn is probably yes, the best exactly. out there right now. It is. I, well, see, I post things I'm interested in, which is all politics. It's got nothing to do with yeah, business. Yeah. And I, I, sure. I know that people are turned off by my politics to a point where they, you know, there's a lot of them, you know, I used to be a Green Party guy. There's no Green Party people buying houses in St. Catharines. First of all, there's only five well, right. there's more now, but, you know, I've been running since 93. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a laughing, it was a joke back then. So, um, I, yeah, I appreciate the, the, your approach. And then you got me on a Thursday, perfect today. And I, I just want to say, well, oh, I got yeah. you here. I want to respect your time and get you off to the rest of your life and night. But, uh, um, you know, um, <clears throat> sorry, I got a brain fart. No worries. Uh, you know, when we'll you cover first, a lot today. Yeah. When you first approach me, I can't wait to listen to this back because, uh, you know, I don't, it, when you're interviewing someone, you can't, you're not present to the whole, you know, you want to keep the conversation going. You think, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. You talk so I fast, feel the same. I do, I do, I do too as well. I know. I'm yeah, sorry. You're going to have to go. Uh, instead of two times the speed, half the speed. People I'm usually looking forward to watching it back. But uh, here I think I'm, well, today I said, well, hey, you know, I could have me on. And you're like, okay. And I think to myself, well, oh man, I'm, I'm not feeling so great today. I, you know, and, you know, I tend to, you know, I want, I want to feel good. I want to be on top of my game. I don't want to come out here and be flat. And then as I'm talking to you, I'm like, geez, I thought I was doing this guy a favor. Look at all the stuff he's given me. And you're bringing, you're bringing me a real awareness about like I'm transitioning. I think I'm transitioning out of real estate. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been looking mm -hmm. at coaching. I actually built a, a coaching business off the books. And, and so when people, oh, cool. are, awesome. are, when people are, pro, you know, prospecting for me for realtor business, I'm like, dude, you got the wrong guy. Cause I'm on my way out or I'm not doing enough mm -hmm, business mm -hmm. to be worth your while right now sure. I'm in this direction. Sure. So sure. Uh, I appreciate that your mm -hmm. approach, number one, you hooked me. That's good. Even in, I, wow. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you know, if you're a closer, you know, hanging out with you for a couple hours would be so great because I, you know, a guy like you, you get on a computer and you're like, Oh, well, like, how'd you do that? Easy. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah sure, sure. a lot of hacks for, for a, oh, a guy like me, but you're a little bit younger than I am too. So 
maybe that's a, a, an advantage as well as far as being up to school, up to speed with all the technology as well. But like I said, I'm sitting sure, here going, sure. who's, who's doing who the favor here? I'm learning all kinds of stuff from you, Paul. <laughs> well, I'm very grateful to be on the show, man. I mean, one thing too is I, I, I think it's just, you know, I have a lot of things in my head that I don't always get to, you know, talk to someone about. So even this is therapeutic for me as far as mm-hmm. articulating, you know, my ever evolving journey and, and seeing how it can be of service to people that, uh, you know, that, that have shared values and whatnot. So hopefully it's, it's useful for, for your viewers. And well, I mean, definitely if you want, I mean, you know, I'm a big food guy. We come from the start in the restaurant marketing world. Um, you know, there's a lot of cool restaurants you can go to and have a meal and I can, yeah, whip out your laptop and we can talk mm-hmm. about things and, uh, I'm a big fan of mo- of mixing, um, you know, the the food world and breaking bread and building relationships and getting yeah. shit done, and making things happen. So uh, I mean, I I've got a, one of my staff members in Niagara. So when I'm up there, I'll let you know. And likewise, when you're Definitely. here in the the six in TO on Queen and Bathurst is where our office is. So always happy okay. to, have to chat. Of course, yeah, yeah. Great. My cousin's got one of the best restaurants around down here. It's called the Wellington Court Cafe. If next time you're down, if you haven't been there yet, oh wow, the world class chef Eric Peacock's his name. So pop Very in cool. there. And, uh, yeah, but let's do this again, though. Let's book another call with maybe a little bit more intentionality. We'll, we'll, we'll cover sure. less and go yeah. deeper into the subjects a little bit. And then, uh, I know that there's going to be some value for people out there, you know, even with my limited uh, viewership or whatnot, there's, you know, mm-hmm. people, I had a guy the other day, he's, you know, I was doing a YouTube stream. He's like, dude, I'm your only viewer. Can you answer my political questions for Craig? <laughs> well, I wasn't, looking, I wasn't looking at the screen. I spend more time, you know, uh, on the interview, but uh, yeah, let's, let's book another, another interview. And let's, like I said, be a little bit more intentional. We'll have less subjects and go deeper on it. And uh, just on the way out again, I want to, I want to respect your time. Contact information. Yeah, website, no worries. Every, Totally. I'll, s- I'll send you. I'll send you all of that. I'll send you all of that no, for sure. Just tell hey, you want to you, you say it out loud? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just talk. People yeah, let's be people. Hold you. I'll put it in the right. Link. If it, yeah, if, if, if people are on the go, I mean, you can just you know honestly just add me on LinkedIn or Instagram or even Facebook. It's Paul David S Q P A U L. Uh, D-A-V-I-D-E-S-C-U, one word. Uh, if, if you recognize in the SQ, just like our, our good old uh, Bianca Andrescu, you know, our math, our, 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 our Wimbledon champion, our Zero. She, she won the U.S. Open. So she's yeah. also a, a, she's a Romanian-Canadian like myself. And uh, we actually share the same birthday. No, no actual relation, but uh, I'm sure we'll cross paths and have to laugh about it too. <laughs> yeah. So it's just Paul David SQ. My email is paul at levelupmortgages.com. Or on the agency side, it's paul at tangu.ca. Tangu, T A N G O O.ca. So yeah, whether it's on email or the social networks, happy to, to chat and see if there's a way that I can be of value. So thanks again for, for having me. And you've got a great YouTube channel, by the way. You're being modest about it. I think you'll get a, hopefully a lot of viewers uh, digging some of these topics and uh, you know, grateful to be on it. And I will share this too with my audience as well. So uh, yeah, excited to perhaps do a part two. And uh, hopefully this is enough to at least get the ball rolling and, and get people a bit more curious going to this decade on ways they can improve and level up their life. Awesome, Paul. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for that today. And uh, wait until I get this. Uh, I've got this live stream going right now, but it's uh, it's just a picture of me. So yeah, wait <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know when you can share it. But I'll try and get that up uh, today or tomorrow. And uh, again, thank you very much for your time. It was a gift, man. We got a lot of our conversations. So thanks a lot. Learned a lot too. Thanks so much, Jim. And thanks to everyone else who's listening. Bye All for right. now. Cheers. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care.